important topic is hydrated cyst. Hydrated cyst is a zoonosis. And it is caused by Echinococcus granulosus. Okay. Hydrated cyst is a type of zoonosis and is caused by Echinococcus granulosus. Okay. It is generally seen in the sheep grazing areas of the world. And is generally seen in humans. Having dogs as their pets okay now there are various types of echinococcus these are echinococcus granulosus echinococcus multilocularis echinococcus vogeli and echinococcus oligarthus these are the echinococcus which infect which can infect humans this echinococcus granulosus is most common or the responsible for responsible for hydrated cyst this echinococcus multilocularis is the one which is responsible for alveolar echinococcosis or malignant hydatidosis okay malignant hydatid disease is caused by echinococcus multilocularis okay this is important now the important points regarding the life cycle okay I will first tell you a few important points that the definitive host which is the definitive host which is the intermediate host and who is the accidental intermediate host. It is easy to remember definitive host this dog is the definitive host okay and intermediate host is sheep and human is the or man is the accidental intermediate host there is no human to human transmission and it is kind of a dead end for the life cycle of the hydrated. Okay. What is the infective stage? Here, infective stage is the egg, which is uh, produced by the dog. Okay. And what is the root of infection? It is feco oral. Okay, now just have a look at the life cycle here. This diagram. Now, uh, the dog is the definitive host. Now, there is uh, the dog has uh, done the ingestion of the contaminated food. Now, there is the growth of the image initially, the immature forms, which then become the adult forms and then through the feces the dog passes the eggs 
these eggs are the infective stage and it goes to the intermediate host who is sheep okay sometimes there is accidental intermediate host and there is human hydatidosis okay now what happens is that the humans ingest these eggs Inge they ingest the uh, contaminated food and the food contain these eggs now what happens is that uh, from the duodenum of the human beings there is presence of this uh, larva that is oncosphere or hexacanth this larva crosses the duodenum and it goes either to the portal vein or to the ivc okay and through the portal vein it reaches the liver so the most common site here is liver but it can reach to the other sites also and the other sites are spleen okay the, the other sites are lung spleen kidney brain and spine okay but most commonly it involves liver followed by lung and followed by spleen okay now suppose there is a patient who is now infected with the hydatid cyst so what will be the most common presentation of the patient so generally there is no gender priority and the it is seen commonly in males and females and generally the patient presents with some palpable abdominal lump okay so there will be palpable abdominal lump on the right upper abdomen and otherwise the patient will be asymptomatic there will be some discomfort due to this lump okay so the clinical features males and females are present they present with the disease equal most patients are asymptomatic most common presentation is palpable asymptomatic intra abdominal lump which is nothing but hepatomegaly okay now how we will investigate the patient the first investigation will be obviously in majority of the hepatobiliary diseases the first investigation is ultrasound okay ultrasound abdomen so apart from this abdominal lump the patient can present also with uh, sometimes there might be pain or tenderness sometimes the patient can present with jaundice okay or there is some compressive symptoms due to this large cyst it can lead to like vomiting nausea sometimes it may lead to gastric outlet obstruction so the presence of this jaundice it gives a hint towards either the presence of a cystobiliary complication or a large cyst compressing the bile duct okay sometimes what happens is that there is a cyst which is present here now there is presence of intrahepatic bile ducts if there is a large cyst there is a possibility that there will be a communication between the cyst and the bile duct and from which the scolex can go inside and it can reach into the bile duct and can lead to compression of the bile duct or like blockage of the bile duct and can lead to 
jaundice okay so if there is presence of jaundice in a patient of hydrated cyst we should suspect presence of a cystobiliary communication we should go for mrcp and see the uh, whether the cvd is normal or whether there is any cystobiliary communication or not okay now we have investigated the first investigation is ultrasound abdomen and we can also get a ct abdomen done to characterize the lesion okay on ultrasound what we see is a large cyst and there is presence of cyst inside the cyst okay so cyst within cyst appearance also known as rosette appearance is characteristic of hydatid disease okay and in ct along with that this cyst within cyst appearance there is a calcification of which is seen peripheral calcification around the cyst so peripheral calcification on ct with the cyst within cyst appearance can also be seen on ct but these are to better characterize the lesion for investigation of choice to confirm the diagnosis is serology okay we do here hydrated serology which is uh, by elisa most commonly we can also go for uh, arc 5 test or immuno blot test these three are the serology tests and this elisa is the most commonly performed and they are 90 to 95 percent sensitive and specific okay for the diagnosis now there was a previous test which there was a test which was done previously not done nowadays sometimes they ask a question and the name of the test is kasoni's intradermal test and injection of sterile hydrated fluid is done in the test thus it is kind of a provocative test and there is there are chances of uh, you can say allergy or hypersensitivity reaction or anaphylaxis and that is why it is obsolete now the chances of uh, detecting the hydatid diseases or the sensitivity is low it is 50 to 60 percent okay so there is low sensitivity it is not done but uh, mcqs can be asked like kasoni's intradermal test or the kasoni's test is used for the diagnosis of hydatid disease okay so this way it is important now the this is uh, a hydatid cyst there is a pericyst here this is a pericyst inside the pericyst there is presence of a a cellular membrane a cellular membrane known as a laminated membrane this pericyst is a compressed normal liver tissue okay pericyst is a compressed normal liver tissue inside the pericyst there is a cellular membrane or the laminated membrane and inside the laminar membrane there is presence of a germinal 
membrane okay there is presence of a germinal membrane or a germinal layer you can say this germinal layer it produces the cyst so initially it produces the cyst known as the brood capsule brood cyst or the small cyst which it is producing when the brood cyst it becomes big in size and it detaches from the germinal layer it becomes a daughter cyst and it also releases cholesterol and fluid which forms hydrated sand okay so this is the structure of the hydrated cyst now nowadays mcqs are asked on the radiological findings also or the imagings so this way you can see here on ct in ct there is presence of uh, here a cyst within cyst appearance okay so this is a hydrated cyst very important from mcq point of view hydrated cyst with a cyst within cyst or rosette appearance okay and then in the second one you can see presence of a germinal membrane here this is a germinal membrane presence of a germinal membrane inside the cyst is suggestive of hydrated cyst okay and this cyst within such a cyst appearance is also suggestive of hydrated cyst okay now there are two classifications based on radiology okay two classifications of hydrated cyst based on radiology one is based on ultrasound known as garbies classification and the second one is based on either ultrasound or ct it is who classification okay first i will tell you the patterns which are seen or which can be seen in hydrated cyst then i will tell you the who classification or the garbies classification okay so you can see here what we can see here in hydrated cyst we can see a simple cyst okay or we can see cyst within cyst appearance or the unilocular cyst or a multilocular cyst we can also see a cyst with a laminar membrane in between okay we can see a cyst with heterogeneous appearance okay or we can see a dead or the calcified cyst okay so these all are the appearances which can be seen on the in the hydrated cyst okay now this ce classification is for the who classification of hydrated cyst okay this is important to understand now firstly i will discuss the who classification so it's ce type 1 is for a fluid collection or a unilocular cystic collection okay ce type 2 is for multivesicular or cyst within cyst appearance ce type 3 is for a fluid collection with split wall it is mentioned or we can say it for a high line membrane or okay membrane in the cyst okay then this ce type 4 is heterogeneous pattern 
CE type 5 is for calcified cyst. Okay. Whereas Garbi's classification is based on ultrasound. In Garbi's classification, The type 1 is a simple fluid collection. Type 2 is a floating membrane. also known as undulating membrane or a water lily or snake sign water lily or a water snake sign okay this type 3 is presence of you can say multiceptated or multiloculated also known as honeycombing okay this type 4 is uh, multiloculated multiseptated with presence of nodules heterogeneous nodules or solid cystic areas and type 5 is for calcified cyst okay now the thing that is important to understand is that uh, this CE type 3 or this split membrane is actually Garbi's type 2 okay so the most important point to understand is that Garbi's type 2 is a WHO type 3 and these points are also important this water lily sign or water snake sign so presence of a water lily sign or water snake sign is suggestive of hydrated cyst which type of hydrated cyst Garvey's type 2 or a WHO CE type 3 okay and honeycombing is also seen in hydrated cyst okay but honeycomb liver is seen in actinomycosis now what is the treatment for hydrated cyst okay the treatment So the treatment is perioperative chemoprophylaxis. And what is the drug of choice for uh, perioperative chemoprophylaxis? The drug of choice is albendazole. The albendazole helps in reducing the recurrence and it helps in decreasing the size of the cyst okay so before going for surgery we will have to first start albendazole this is perioperative okay so we will have to uh, before give albendazole before surgery 
and after the after the procedure then we'll have to continue the albendazole okay this is perioperative albendazole which helps in decreasing the recurrence and decreasing the size of the cyst okay now what all are the procedures generally the procedures the, there are four procedures first is pair second is deroofing then third is pericystectomy and next is liver resection okay this pair is most preferred if anatomically feasible okay this pericystectomy is most effective treatment and this liver resection is the most radical treatment okay now we will discuss all this treatment one by one now first we will discuss pair okay this pair stands for puncture aspiration of content installation of scolicidal agents and reaspiration okay pair we'll first puncture and then we'll aspirate whole of the content then we'll inst instill the scolicidal agents inside we'll wait for some time and then we'll reaspirate the scolicidal agents along with the remaining fluid okay now it is most preferred for anatomically suitable cysts okay now what all are the scolicidal agents we generally do pair by ultrasound guided or we can also do by ct guidance okay there is a uh, another modification of pair which is pvac modification of pair is pvac in which we are adding a catheter drainage okay we first do a puncture then we aspirate all the contents and then we install the uh, instill the scolicidal agent and then after re aspiration we put a catheter to drain everything okay now what all are the scolicidal agents we are using what is the percentage of the scolicidal agents we are using it for how long A few questions have been asked now we are using uh, hypertonic saline okay we are using betadine or povidone iodine then we are using savlon or cetrimide chlorhexidine we are using absolute alcohol okay now what is the percentage okay this is important <laughs> normally the normal saline is 0.9% saline okay the hypertonic saline is 3% saline generally we are using for Uh, IV administration. Here we are using twenty percent hypertonic saline. Okay, so this twenty percent hypertonic saline is hundred percent scolicidal within six minutes. This is important. Twenty percent hypertonic saline. 
okay this povidone iodine is 10% povidone iodine okay and this cetrimide is 0.5% cetrimide with 0.05% chlorhexidine this absolute alcohol is 95% okay now what all are the uh, scolicidal agents which are not used scolicidal agents because of toxicity are formalin and silver nitrate okay now what all are the contraindications to pair okay and now i'll make you understand suppose if there is a cyst here and while puncturing there is a possibility that the cyst fluid might rupture okay which may lead to anaphylaxis so the cyst should not be located peripherally it should be intrahepatic okay so a peripherally located cyst is a contraindication if the cyst is located very close to the large blood vessels and a proper uh, you can say needle puncture is not possible or a safe needle puncture is not possible that is a contraindication if it is a multi loculated cyst then drainage of all the cyst and the insertion of the scolicidal agent will not be a, a proper scolicidal effect there will not be a proper scolicidal effect so a multi locular cyst is a contraindication and a cystobiliary communication is also a contraindication for pair because uh, suppose on ultrasound if we have aspirated and there is bile so there is a possibility of cystobiliary communication we should not instill the scolicidal agent and we should take this patient for surgery why because the during the installation of scolicidal agents there is a possibility that the scolicidal agent will go to the bile duct and can lead to some biliary complications okay and then if there is a cyst in the lung or the brain then in cyst in hydrated cysts which are present in lung or brain there is no peri cyst okay so there is no surrounding tissue to contain the scolicidal agents there okay so in that case it is better to avoid pair and if it, there is a calcified cyst or a dead cyst then the calcified cyst is already dead there is no point in uh, in such installation of the scolicidal agents there okay so these all are the contraindications and in all these cases we we prefer the other surgical modalities what all are the contraindications to pair first is a peripherally located cyst okay then inaccessible cyst multi loculated cyst cystobiliary communication cysts in lung and brain because there is no peri cyst and calcified or dead cyst okay now i have told you that this is a germinal membrane and there is a peri cyst there inside the germinal membrane there is a uh, oh this is a peri cyst then there is uh, the laminated membrane inside the laminated membrane there is a germinal membrane which is producing the content okay this peri cyst is a compressed normal liver tissue and 
the hydrated cyst derives its nutrition from pericyst okay so uh, if we are opening the cyst and we are removing the capsule of the cyst partially and we are evacuating the content then it will be deroofing that we have deroofed the cyst we have evacuated the content and we are putting in the momentum okay so this will be deroofing with omentopexy or omentoplasty what we are doing in deroofing suppose this is the cyst here we are uh, just removing this much of the wall here and we are evacuating the content so this will be something like this we are evacuating the content and then on top of that we are putting omentum inside okay this will be deroofing plus omentopexy or omentoplasty on the other hand if this is not successful then what we can do suppose this is the cyst here we can remove whole of the cyst okay along with the pericyst okay and this will be something like this this will be known as pericystectomy this is the removal of whole of the cyst along with the pericyst this is the most effective treatment there is another treatment suppose there is a cyst here what we can do we can remove this portion of the liver okay and this will be liver resection this is the most radical treatment and then after surgery we'll have to continue albendazole as a perioperative prophylaxis protocol